Matt. What's up, man? We got we got surplus. All kind of Swiss stuff, yeah, man. We got what kind of Swiss stuff? Well, we got 1889 tapes, 9611s, K1911, long and short, K31s. We got ordnance revolvers. We've got Lugers. We've got P49. All kind of great stuff in this box. No, this is just for representation. Oh, it's an okay. unboxing. Oh, okay, all right, that, that checks out. Let's talk surplus. Welcome back everybody, Clint here today. Matt, what's up? We are with Classic Firearms and we're happy to bring a new shipment of some Swiss surplus in. Swiss Palooza. So, if that's what you want to call it, sure. But we're excited to have it here. It's been a while since we've seen some surplus, obviously. Uh, we got some M1s in not too long ago. Mm -hmm. I think that was actually our last surplus video where some M1s, maybe some infields and stuff. But anyway, uh, we have now some antiques. We got all sorts of goodness, actually. Right, we got a lot, actually. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to be covering this in different segments, but all in today's video. So let's just go ahead and hop right into this. Matt, what's on the table? So what we have here is an antique. It's not even really a firearm bar, yeah. per the law, but uh, this is the 1889 Schmidt Rubin. So uh, Colonels Schmidt and Rubin uh, designed the straight pull action that's used in Switzerland in this and several subsequent rifles. And uh, I'm, they're really cool pieces of history. They like, are. Again, you know, not considered a firearm under modern uh, federal law, mm -hmm. but it uses a 7.5 by 53 and a half smokeless yeah. powder cartridge. And it's got a 12 round magazine. Like yeah. it is the OG high cap. Yeah, you gotta fix it. Yeah. <laughs> the OG high cap. Yeah. Yeah. So what I like about these guys, first of all, th they look almost like works of art. And I think that's just something when we see rifles of this age and, and how old are these? So again, you know, we're looking at something that started production in 1891. Yeah. Uh, and then they started switching all the way through like eight, uh, 1953. Wow. So a little over 100 years, 130-ish. But uh, anyway, so super cool. And when you start looking at guns of this age, yeah, they look gorgeous. You see the attention to detail that goes just look into the rear sight aperture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is pretty wild. Like I mean, all the little Swiss shields all over I, on the yeah, buttstock up yeah, here on the handgun. I mean, that right there, what in the world? <laughs> Volley sight, baby. Yeah, so I mean, you get an entire, I mean, yeah, you're just like, okay, cool. Well, there's an entire regiment headed towards us. Sweet, how many meters are they away? Oh, I don't know, like 20,000? <laughs> All right, sweet. Let's start lobbing a bunch of seven five Swiss in that general direction. Yeah, area denial, man. Yeah, you're not yeah. aiming at one thing. You're just like you're not gonna want to go here. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> when you don't have artillery, you get Schmidt Rubens. Uh, anyway, so what's cool, like you talked about, you've got the Swiss shield markings on here. I've got a number six mm -hmm. on this guy, depending on how you're reading that. It could be a very well done nine. But anyway, got a number six right here on top of the stock, which I think is pretty cool. Do any of these have that? Any of the other ones? So yes. Also Same. a six. Yep. Oh, interesting. Yep. Oh, wow. Okay. What? This what one's got mean? a number one. Oh, really? There you go. Oh, that's pretty interesting. So I'm, I don't know personally what that would be there for. Do you have any idea? So I don't know that. I'm not familiar with that mark. I would assume it's either like where it was made yeah. or maybe an inspector. Okay. Oh, well, yeah, that, that makes sense. And then again, the Swiss shield, this one is pronounced very well in the stock on this guy, a little bit darker. This one almost seems like kind of like unfinished almost, mm -hmm. which is almost like yeah, somebody cool. may have stripped it or something. Yeah, which is very cool. But anyway, let me try to show off the having that Swiss shield right there. That's shown very well on this guy. Again, there's that number six right up top. But very cool. Now, ammunition for these, it yeah. can't take your modern loads, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, 7.5 by 55 is too high pressure. Yeah. But uh, while I'm not sure if anyone makes 7.5 by 53 and a half, you can reload 7.5 by 53 and a half using the brass from 7.5 by 55. Yeah. You would need to trim it and you know make sure your loading information is correct when you're reloading it. But that is one way you can you could shoot these rifles today. That's pretty cool. And on top of that too, the reason you can't use modern cartridges through it are due to the pressures and. Well, it wasn't exactly smokeless, smokeless powder yet, was it? Well, so these were like basically some of the very first. This and the LaBelle were like yes. the first smokeless powder. Okay. But, you know, we do have a lot of advancements from then to now. And even yeah. later Schmidt Rubens, you know, there was constant innovation in uh, firearms technology, especially propellants and things like that. So, yeah, do not shoot modern ammunition in this. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they are still functional. Uh, again, not considered firearms because of the age of them. But uh, yeah, you know, this would be a, a really cool, you know, even if you just want to buy it as part of a collection. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And of course, due to these being surplus and their age, don't expect perfection. As I like to say when it comes to surplus, I every now and then actually appreciate some character, mm -hmm. right? Uh, especially if you can find some like trench art and whatnot on them. Uh, but like on, for instance, I just want to point out the charging handle on this guy uh, is obviously broken. Yep. Um, well, it's not 
hindering it from being functional. But you can see here where you've got the pin that holds it in place is a little bit more exposed compared to say like this guy that looks like to be a little bit better condition. Yeah, and this is an early Bakelite material, so yeah. it's kind of a proto-plastic. Um, and then, you know, also just, you can see the variation in stocks. You know, yeah. one of the things we always say about surplus is that you can never tell what you're gonna get when you start getting into those crates. Uh, so we went from dark all the way up to kind of different variations going up to lighter. Uh, you know, you can see some of these have a little bit of striping in yeah. them. Like uh, these stocks here, you know, there's kind of a little bit of almost tiger striping yeah. versus, you know, some of these have really nice grain patterns. Right. So it's gonna, it's gonna differ. But with that being said, I know we've got some other ones. Let's go ahead and bring those. All right, so now what we've got here is the next rifle in the Schmidt Rubin family, the 9611. Yes. So the 9611 is a adaptation of the 1896 rifle. And basically every rifle was converted. When they adopted the 1911 rifle, they went through and they changed some configurations of the 96 rifle to match so that you had as close as possible to the current issue rifle right. with the old rifles that remained in service. Uh, you can see that very distinctively they have this graft where they put a yeah. pistol grip into what was previously a straight stop. Yeah, or kind of resembles that type of grip, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. which is very cool because I mean, it's again, look at the craftsmanship that goes into that. I mean, that's that's perfection. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there's I don't think I've ever seen one where there was any kind of gap in that joint, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, it's very distinctive to see that. Uh, and then they also went in and reworked the rifles to make sure they could use what we would consider to be modern ammunition. So like the GP11, right. uh, 7.5 by 55. So all of these rifles can shoot modern ammunition and they are rifles, legally speaking, these yeah. are firearms now. Gotcha, okay. And so these have been rebarreled to accept all that type of fun stuff. Right, right. I mean, way back in the day, but yeah, yeah. The, you know, so these will accept modern ammunition. And uh, you know, again, it's, it's kind of cool that you have that history of the growth, right? You started with the uh, 1889, right. in which the 96, which became the 9611, yeah. and then you know we'll carry on into the future with the Yeah, new. and let me just clarify because I saw you try to try to save that. Uh, when I say rebarreled, I don't mean recently. Like yeah, no, yeah. when this became the 9611 is when it was rebarreled and could accept the 75, like the GP11. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you know this isn't a modern rebarrel. No. Um, and again, you still have a lot of these really cool you know, like little touches from from Switzerland. So you have like the little Swiss shield here. Yeah. Um, if we look. Uh, usually you will find some in other places, although yeah. sometimes I mean, top, of receive, top of the receiver's got all sorts of neat markings. Oh yeah, it's got all kind of like cool stampings here on the receiver on the side mm -hmm. and the top. Um, again, you know, you still have these Bakelite handles on the, the bolt. Um, I don't know if we, we've explained exactly how the straight pull bolt action works. So effectively, it's, it's, the, it's definitely, I think it is actually like my favorite action. It's just so unique. And I don't know if you guys have ever had the opportunity to cycle a straight pull before, uh, but Ryan's got a K31. We take it out to the range whenever we can find some GP11. And uh, we'll just every now and then just kind of like do a mad minute with it. Mm -hmm. It is so easy just to rack that thing. And then it's such a soft shooting gun. And that's the shorter one. You know, you take these longer boys, I bet they're even more of a pleasure to shoot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And you could definitely get a lot more performance out of the longer barrel. Um, so you basically have a bolt that has a cammed sleeve around it. And so the sleeve is what's making the actual bolt lugs yeah. turn while you're just moving it straight back and forth. Right. So, you know, that's a very interesting and uh, complicated kind of procedure. You yeah. can imagine all the way back at the beginning of the 1900s, them yeah. developing this, machining it, getting it right so that this works yeah. as smoothly as it does. Yeah. And they're renowned the world over as being some of the, you know, highest performing surplus rifles. Yeah, and we'll show you guys here in a bit too that some of these straight pulls have actually been used a lot in competitive shooting as well. Yeah, so as we get into some of the more recent yeah. rifles, uh, you'll see that they are still used today in shooting competitions. Yeah, and also too, just wanna go ahead and point out really quick, some of you guys may have noticed like the little cap, stuff like that on the previous batch of rifles. We can't promise those. Right. Some some will come with a little snow cap, some won't, um, but that's just something that's gonna be kind of like a luck of the draw type of thing, because not all of these came with one of those. Right, uh, when it comes to certain accessories, uh, unfortunately it's just luck of the draw. Sometimes it will come get surplus rifles with slings or yeah. like the nose caps. Uh, we guarantee the rifle, it will be a complete rifle, it'll have the magazine and everything, but yeah. no accessories. Cool, let's go ahead and talk about the next ones. All right. So now we've got some more long boys here. Which ones are these? So these are the 1911 long rifles, the Langa Gewehr. Um, so, you know, again, it's a, uh, <laughs> it is the longer version of the K1911 rifle that was adopted in 1911. Gotcha. Um, and so this is what they were trying to replicate with the 9611s was th this handling. Oh, I see. Yep. Uh, so you can see how it's got the, the pistol grip here in the stock. And so that's why they grafted it into the, uh, the previous rifle. But, uh, I mean, functionally, they're going to be very similar rifles. Uh, right. you know, they, they made some small changes, uh, 
but again, most of those are going to have been retrofitted onto the 9611. So what you have is a fairly equivalent rifle, but this one was made as is, as opposed to being something that they adopted and changed uh, on the, the last rifle. So. Right, cool. So show up in like the different variations of the stock and like how dark that guy yeah. is there. So, you know, again, we, we keep sending out all these samples because we want you to have a chance to see all the different options as far as, uh, possibilities, I should say, as far as what you might receive. You can see that the blue on this is very dark, yeah. um, although it's kind of a matte finish on it at this time. And the stock is pretty dark as opposed to, you know, more of the traditional kind of almost blue finish on this rifle's metal, as opposed to more like a slate gray here. Um, but, you know, again, these are still uh, pretty much equivalent mechanical rifles, a six shot magazine, 7.5 by 55, same as the modern ammunition. Right. Um, and again, just a pleasure to shoot these things. No, you're absolutely right. They, they really are. Now, before we move on, um, we do have another, another carbine coming out, right? So we got, we got quite a few of these rifles and I just want to go ahead and let you guys know what we do have coming. Right. So this is the end of the long boys. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go to some shorter rifles, including the shorter brother of this one. Okay. Little bro. Yeah, perfect. Let's hop into it. Now we've got the actual carbines up here, right? Yeah, man. So pretty much take exactly what we saw before, mm -hmm. cut it down, and now we've got some K11 carbines. Yeah, sure, boys. So K911 is for carabiner, which means carbine, as opposed to the previous ones being G1911, so yeah. Gewehr rifle. Um, so this is exactly the same thing as the last one, except shorter, uh, which of course, you know, you're gonna issue in a variety of situations. Uh, if you have cavalry, they can't yeah. have the long rifle getting on and off horses, or, you know, as we move into vehicles, uh, yeah. you know, getting in and out of a Jeep or something. Or how about just carrying the son of a gun around? <laughs> <laughs> That's true, but remember, at this time, you know, the standard issue rifle is still the big one, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I was saying, like, hey, but, you know, I already know that if I'm given the M4 over the M16 for a field exercise, I'm going to take the M4 because I don't feel like carrying around the 20-inch guy. And, and I mean, if you think about the the weight difference, this is so much bigger of a weight difference than yes. an M4 to an M16. It fact, really is. Technology M16s are, are, are really not that heavy, no. even with the big barrel, because it's that thin barrel. Anyway, yeah. far afield. Uh, but yeah, and of course being Switzerland, they have ski soldiers and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, you know, we've got the, the shorter version for certain specific soldiers to use depending on their kind of uh, MOS. Yeah, so perfect. So now in addition to these guys, we also have a very select few, only one of these, right? Uh, which it might not even make it to the website. I might I might be taking this home. Um, uh, this actually has a matching bayonet. That's right. Serial number on the rifle matches the serial number on the bayonet. Yeah, and that's what we've got on this guy here as well, where we are showing that off a little bit. So you'll see the sheath and all of that goodness for the bayonet, which I think is super cool. And just in case you guys are curious about what type of condition the bayonet is in, you might be able to... Yeah, just kind of slip it out. Yeah, might, might be able to, but... You're going to see that it does have a lot of grime and grease, but it is a very well-oiled blade. Yeah. So with all that being said, I think for, and what does it say, Waffenfabrik, Neuhausen, I mean, dude, that's pretty awesome. That is very cool. So yeah, we do have only one of the 1911s, or excuse me, K11s, uh, short, mm -hmm. uh, available with a matching bayonet. And 8579, and on this guy we do have 8579 on the receiver, so... So that's super cool. Man. Don't miss out on that. Now, we also have, a lot of you might consider this to be a sin, right? Whenever you get something as cool as these and then sporterize it. <laughs> and uh, how many of these do we have? We have one. We only have one of these also, and this is a sporterized uh, a K11. Right. And I will say that for a sporterized rifle, they did a good job. I think that yeah. the refinish of the stock looks really good. Obviously, you know, they had to cut off a lot of wood to remove the upper handguard. You can even see right up here where that one barrel band was up front, mm -hmm. you know, right up here where the wood would meet on it. But, you know, the reason why people did this is to reduce weight for the most part. If you were to yeah. be walking through the woods hunting, there was no reason to have this extra wood and just adding extra weight. Um, while not really a big fan of sporterized military surplus, remember that this was probably done by someone who used this rifle in the military and then took it home, which is something they did in Switzerland. Well, it, it is P-marked, so it makes complete sense. Um, yeah. And then they decided to do this to their own rifle. Uh, and at this point, you know, we have the option to uh, to acquire it as part of this group of rifles. Um, and, and it makes sense to me, though, because your military issue rifle, if you're actually going to be taking this home, now all of a sudden it's going to be like a primary hunting rifle. It's mm -hmm. like, why have all the added weight? 
Right. I'm going to be taken walking around through the woods. But what this entire conversation has been about is having those long boys to short boys and weight reduction, stuff like that. Well, furthermore, on this one here, and one of your favorite snipers, yep, Sima Haya. Uh, so he's a Finnish sniper known yeah. as the White Death. Hundreds of confirmed kills against Russians in the Winter War. <laughs> All right. Uh, and he actually owned two sporterized Mosin Nagant. So he used the uh, you know M29, I think, as his rifle. And he was able to, uh, he, after the war, he kept two Mosin Nagants uh, that were sporterized yeah. in his personal collection. Yeah. So, Which is I mean, you can't argue with the experts, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was a special ball experience he had. But anyway, all right. Uh, now, as far as carbines go, we still have one more. One more carbine. Yep. Let's, let's see. Now we've got ourselves some K31s, which... Everyone's favorite Swiss rifle. Yeah, these things are pretty sweet. So these actually differentiate from the K11s that we saw before. We got different receivers, different different actions almost. Right, and as much as Same they... straight pull, but yeah. As much as they resemble the previous rifles, these are technically not... Schmidt Rubens anymore. So, right. you know, these have been redesigned and they do not use the exact same uh, mechanisms. So if we actually were to pull out this uh, bolt, you can see that the locking lugs on the bolt are right there at the front. front yeah. And if we compare that to like a 1911 bolt, they would actually be almost halfway down the body of the bolt. Um, and so that allows you to have a shorter receiver, meaning that even though this is the same overall length as a 1911, a K-1911, you have, a longer, barrel. You have yeah. a longer barrel. Yeah. Um, so that has obviously some ballistic advantages and things. So, uh, other than that, you know, you can see obvious differences. We've moved to metal machined uh, lug handles, yeah. As well as the magazine, which, uh, you know, is now differently shaped. Uh, you know, the other one has kind of like a flat surface, even though it's right. at an angle. These are rounded, but they're kind of oriented horizontally to the barrel. Right. Um, again, we wanted some different options out here, so you can see the different, like, options as far as stocks go, or at least possibilities. I keep saying options. You're not going to be able to choose an option. There are possibilities. Right. Yeah, exactly. And of course, we do have a few more of these than we do with the K11s that have a matched bayonet, but you can tell this guy right here, ending in 662, has a matched bayonet. So if you purchase one, you might be able to get the one from the video. But That's this right. is also serialized at 662, which is very cool. And you'll notice too that uh, these could use a little bit of love. That's a lot of grease built up on this guy. Yes. Uh, so noticing that there, uh, it is still super cool because these were manufactured with the bayonet and throughout the years, these have actually stayed together. Yeah. And that's not always it's the almost case. almost a miracle, right? Yeah. Uh, this was a great example of kind of someone who did some little customization. So there's a, a length of pull extension here the underneath the butt pad. pad. Yeah. Uh, you can see someone's name here. It says uh, H. Buren here. Uh, Cool. On the side. Yeah. And then what I really liked about this was the coloration here on the receiver. So yeah. bluing is done with a variety of different minerals and right. as it fades, sometimes it can get into a variety of different colors. We've seen like uh, things that are almost black fade into blue or green, or in this case, almost like a kind of copper color. Right. Um, but it's just really, you know, visually striking. I thought it was really attractive. I wanted yeah. to highlight that. And then you'll notice this one too, that's kind of like remained a little unfinished as well, which yep. I think this looks really, really good and really clean. And you've got this guy. And then we wanted to point out again, you know, oh, that yeah. people do use these in shooting competitions. In fact, Clint, I believe there's one more right off camera if you can yeah. grab that real quick. Um, but all of these different tags are stickers that indicate that it was used in a kind of regional shooting competition. The, the word you'll see is like continental cantons are kind of like their states. Uh, and so you have different, you know, notes, uh, notations that they were participants in these different competitions. Right, and then you've got this guy over here which is like what Swiss's what national competition it looks like it almost says mm -hmm. but you know I think that is super cool there and you'll notice too that this has that cap that I was talking about. Yep, there you go, that yeah. snow cap. Yeah, so this one does have that. And by the way, if you've ever like I said, if you ever get the chance to shoot these, these have fantastic triggers in them. They are so nice, but you can see very clearly the Swiss crest on this guy as well, right up top of the receiver. This one does have a sling with it. Again, we have some that do have the matched bayonets. And then we have even um, even harder to find ones. Yeah. Uh, we actually gave one of these away a, a little while ago, but it's actually one of the Swiss snipers. Mm -hmm. And we gave away this guy here, which if you didn't see our video, announcing this as a giveaway way back when. It's not currently the giveaway. Uh, it's a little bit more modern, our current giveaway. Um, but this guy, notice the bipod. Yep. 
That right there is your bipod, so it's way back close to the shooter, which is a little bit different. Uh, but what's neat about this too is the scope that it comes with and its own little carrying can. So you've got a scope. The, uh, there are scope bases actually machined directly into the receiver. So this is the ZFK-55. It's a variation of a K-31. And what's really interesting is that they had to basically uh, rotate the rifle in the stock. So they've redesigned the stock and it's rotated about mm, 30 degrees or so, 20 degrees. Somewhere along in the lines, stock, but you might be able to pick up on so, that. So that when you are ejecting, uh, you know, it's ejecting more toward the side so that when you mount the scope, it is not interfering with the fact that otherwise the it would open like directly above the action. Yeah, and one thing that's cool too is this is like an original almost QD design because that guy just pops right in mm -hmm. and it's there. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty awesome. And of course you got this huge muzzle brake yeah. out here. No, this thing is super cool. Now, this is one iteration of the Swiss Sniper. Mm -hmm. We do have another one that we want to show you guys. Yep. Uh, there you go. So this is the uh, another, again, kind of a variation of a K31. This is the ZFK43, I believe. And this has, again, you know, a sight that is... Kind of like a periscope. Type. Yeah, it's like a periscope. periscope. Yeah. So when you look in here, you have some mirrors and lenses that bounce it up here and go uh, up to this aperture here. So, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting... Uh, way of mounting scope. Uh, yeah. You actually have a rear sight mounted right here, as well as your standard sight mounted here. Uh, you know, I believe that they have this in, uh, what, what is it, Battlefield? Uh, Cold War. Cold War, Cold War. there, there it is, is. yeah. Uh, and it's got that very, dis uh, you know, distinctive sight there that's, uh, again, you know, there's machining on the receiver itself to yeah. accept this sight. Uh, but yeah, you know, this is a really cool variation of the K31, still in 7.5 by 55. Uh, yeah, so we have options for, I believe we have one of these and we have a couple of the 55s, yeah. I believe. So super cool. So check those out. Now let's move on to some pistolas. Pistols. All right, so what we've got here is the 1906 Lugers and a couple of different variations of them. So uh, actually these two in the middle are a uh, modification called the 0624. So you'll see that they still retain the wooden uh, grip panels. And uh, what Clint's holding is the 0629 where they've moved to a Bakelite. Yeah. Panel. There are a lot of different uh, small details that show the simplification of machining. So you right. can see like the, the knurling. knurling around yep. the actual toggle there. Yep. Yeah. Now, Lugers are definitely one of the coolest pistols ever made yes. on earth because of that really cool toggle action. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a very unique system. There, I personally don't know of any other type of pistol that utilizes this system personally. Now, granted, there might be like similar ones, some older ones, like uh, what's the one that was much bigger? The Bergman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. But again, like I don't, I don't have that much familiarity with those firearms of that era. But as you can tell, these things are absolutely beautiful, beautiful pistols, very well crafted, and yes, a lot of fun to shoot. And they do have these in two chamberings, but we only have 30 Luger. That's correct? right. Yeah. So they also did make these a nine mil. Yes. The nine mil that we all know and love and can shoot that cartridge. Even the modern loadings, not sure about a plus P. Mm, Wouldn't do that, yeah. but standard, standard pressure is nine mil. It'll work just fine. But all we have is 30 Luger. Now we do have uh, different custom options that are going to be available. So whether you want the uh, 0624 or the 0629, mm -hmm. and uh, with the 0629, you know the standard Bakelite grips are going to be like black or brown, and so we probably also have a custom option for those yeah. nice red Bakelite grips there. Yeah, it's kind of like terracotta look, whatever. But yeah, and as we mentioned before, uh, you know soldiers were able to purchase their firearms when they left military service. Yeah. So we uh, will see a P mark on the firearm if it was purchased. Yeah. So usually uh, we will also have a custom option if you would like to select a P marked firearm. Yeah, to see if any of these actually are P marked. Because typically, yeah, here we go. Here's one that's a uh, P59. And you can see that right on the side of the gun. Is that one P marked yeah, also? Yeah, right there in front, in front of the front. trigger guard. That's typically where I see it, either right in front of the trigger guard or sometimes right on the side there. And uh, we will also have the option to uh, add a holster. Yeah. So you can see holsters do come in a variety of mm, Wear conditions. and look yeah. and what, what it might be. Yeah. So, you know, some might have this purse strap, others are just belt mounted. Uh, they have the option to, you know, hold an extra magazine. magazine. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you are interested in a original holster, that is also gonna be an option for you. Excellent. And these aren't the final pistols we have as well. We also have what are claimed to be some of the most accurate pistols in the world. That's right. And some revolvers. Let's check them out. The P49, ladies and gentlemen, still holds a record of being one of the most accurate pistols in the world. Um, it might be challenged by a few other guns out there now, but 
This is an awesome firearm. And also to the civilian variant with the 210, the P210. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just a fantastic little semi-auto. And just to clarify, when he yeah. says the most accurate, it's the most accurate production. Production. I, sh I should say that, yes. So, thank you. But anyway, Matt, what can you tell us about these guys? Well, I mean, so it is basically, uh, you know, adopted in 1949 and it's a 9mm semi-automatic hangout. Super modern compared to everything else we've looked at today. Yeah. Uh, single stack magazine, single action. I mean, they are just like some of the crispest trigger pulls ever. Got yeah. that super low, super low bore axis, right. uh, which is obviously what leads itself to the high accuracy potential there. Um, but yeah, I mean, just fantastic little handguns, man. Yeah, and you can see too that all these do have the Swiss mark right on top there. All these do have that on the slide right after, mm -hmm. since they're all Swiss yep. production, they typically have that there. And of course, the controls on them, very easy to manipulate, <laughs> safe and fire. I mean, doesn't get much more difficult than that. <laughs> um, they do of course have Simpler a European style heel mag release. Yes. You know, that's very common in European firearms. Yep. And like you said too, single stack, but completely awesome firearms. 10 out of 10 would recommend. And we have shot one before on the mm -hmm. channel. And man, these things do just shoot so well. Low recoil, again, thanks to that low bore access. access. And uh, the gun's definitely a lot more accurate than I am. So, But there you have it. Now, before uh, we move on to these guys, anything else you guys that you should share on this other than I mean, whatever so else? Uh, as with all of the surplus guns we have today, we will offer a hand select. Uh, we don't have, I believe, any other custom options. There's no yeah. uh, real, you know, these were production firearms and they just wasn't the type of variation you see in a lot of this other surplus stuff that's from earlier. So uh, I think hand select is the only custom option on these, but that's also gonna be true for all the other guns we've looked at. Uh, as far as our next one, uh, you know, this is kind of a little something newer, something older. So these are the 1882 Ordnance revolvers that are chambered in 7.5 Ordnance. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, you know, simple kind of revolver. Uh, there are two variations that uh, I know of, is the original 1882 and then 1882-29, which is what all of what we have are. Yeah. Uh, some of the differences you note, the original had an octagonal barrel, this one has a rounded barrel. Yeah. And again, kind of like with the Lugers, they just went through and they simplified some of the construction. The, the knurling on the loading gate is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, again, the hammer becomes a little bit different where uh, I believe the original had a fixed firing pin and this is actually a separate connected piece with this roll pin. Well, it's, that kind of makes sense too, because if the firing pin does break on you, you don't have to replace that the whole hammer. Part. Yeah, yeah, you just knock out that that pin that you guys can see right here. It looks like just like a standard roll pin that you just replace the firing pin. So it made for, if you had to do a uh, field repair, mm -hmm. made a lot easier than having to actually go in here, take the gun apart, remove the hammer, and then all that type of fun Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and a lot of times you see that kind of uh, change in the manufacturing of firearms because they were looking to make them faster, uh, less expensive, and more reliable. You know, when yeah. you first introduce something, maybe you have things that didn't come up in field testing before it was adopted, and so yep. you're like, hey, this is going to be so much better. I mean, that's why you have all these different generations of like one pistol. Glock. <laughs> right, so again, just all these different advancements in technology and everything else along the way. But very cool stuff, guys. And like Matt said, for all of our surplus items, if you do want to have the best of the best, what one of our employees will do whenever you select the hand select options is take the 10 guns right off the top and then select the best of those 10. All right, so be, feel free to utilize that option. And of course, with surplus, as I like to say, don't expect perfection. These guns, even though these actually look really, really good, uh, every now and then you will see some nicks, you'll see some imperfections in these guys, and that's just because, well, they're surplus. Yeah, these they're not brand used. new. Yeah, these are not brand new, exactly. But they come with a history that you cannot get from a new fire. Yeah, which is pretty awesome. So anyway, check out all of our Swiss surplus, of course. Swiss Apalooza. <laughs> It is our Swiss Apalooza. And if you're not signed up for our emails, make sure you get signed up for our emails at classicfirearms.com. So that way you can see all of the different offerings that we have. And of course, so you don't miss out on whatever gun we might be giving away. That's right. Like right now is the SCAR 20S. So head on over to classicfirearms.com to get your hands on the SCAR 20 or at least get your entries on it. It is chambered in 6.5 Creedmoor and well, is a lot of fun to shoot. Utilize the code where you see at the bottom of the screen right now. So if you're not paying attention, you're gonna have to eyes over here and you're going to have to type in that code word for those extra 100 entries. But you have a more preferred method, don't you? Yeah, so remember that the best way to get extra entries is always gonna to be to refer friends uh, if you have friends. And if they won't sign up for you, go get better friends. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's exactly right. Guys, we'll leave it off there. As always, we appreciate you and your business. God bless. And we'll see you next time at classicfirearms.com.